Hi there. My name is Andrew Sweeney. I'm a blogger, a writer, a teacher, a musician. Sometimes I put out YouTube videos. I've recently done a series of conversations with a guy named Alexander Bard, and I'm about to launch a new set of conversations with him. But this video is about Zizek and Peterson and their recent debate. I'm an admirer of both men uh, for different reasons. Last year, I wrote a short piece where I defended Peterson against against uh, Zizek's rather shallow critique. However, over time, I've also been developing a critique of Peterson, and I have renewed interest in Zizek. So I started binging on Zizek's fat philosophy books around the time of the Trump election. The last book I read of his was called Total Recoil. And I also read Living in the End Times. I like his titles very much. Um, Anyway, shortly after my sojourn into Zizek, the Peterson uh, revolution hit, and I spent a great deal of time thinking and writing about the dangerous um, professor from Canada. Uh, and they're both very different, so I'm gonna talk about some of the differences and similarities. So Zizek's books are a jungle. Huh? You need a machete to cut through them. There's a lot of dense Lacanian verbiage, verbiage, but also great insights. Zizek is a good storyteller, a real humorist, um, which sometimes makes people forget that he's also a important Hegelian philosopher. Um, and Peterson's politics often get in the way of his deeper works. So this has been one of my concerns with Peterson is to let's get to the heart of Peterson and sort of try to ignore most of the, the politics. Let's start with the end of the debate. I'm going to go backwards here and the concluding remarks. So Peterson ended on a quite an optimistic note. He said he was hoping that he would, that people would leave the debate um, with a belief in the power of communication between people of different views. Zizek, on the other hand, was much less rosy. Um, he hoped to shatter people a bit. He wanted to stir the, the pot. So both men uh, have a professed pessimism, although Peterson is less pessimistic. And the fact that Zizek is a philosophical pessimist makes him a strange kind of Marxist which Peterson pointed out in the debate. Uh, since Marxism is often about creating a utopian future. Another thing which is interesting to note, and I've written about this before, is the physical energetic differences between the two men. Some people might think that body language is an irrelevant subject, but how we present ourselves might have something to do with our philosophy, might be, might be related. So Zizek has the body language of a kind of a jester, the fool, the idiot. He's always twitching and sniffing and gesticulating and sometimes going into this fetal position. He's sort of like a character actor. He uses his bodily tics for, you know, comedic rhetorical purposes. The point is that the clown can say more than the ordinary person can say because he is an outsider. And Peterson's persona is strikingly different. He's the Protestant preacher, the gentleman, the person can, very concerned with saying just the right word. He never stutters. So you have Zizek, the court jester, uh, and Peterson, the the old fashioned preacher somewhat, which is a nice dynamic. So Peterson is very still and poised. He's, he's elegant, he's clear. Uh, whereas Zizek is manic and he was, he has a sort of trademarks accent and stuttering. And I was thinking that this is like order meeting chaos. Peterson's all about order, and Zizek is all about chaos on some level. 
which isn't to say that Zizek is not capable of being orderly, but he likes to be provocative and say odd, strange things rather than keep to the script. In fact, he was never on the script <laughs> during this debate. And I also was thinking that beneath Peterson's very cool, not cool, very um, proper demeanor, there are some shadowy elements. So in my first piece about Peterson and Zizek, I wrote about the communication differences between the two men. Um, I said that Peterson is a good listener. And Zizek doesn't listen, he, he monologues. But I like the fact that Zizek doesn't put on airs or pretend to lower himself to the, the usual you know, bullshit. Whereas Peterson, on the other hand, is very magnanimous, always very available to the audience. As a clinical psychologist, he makes an effort to listen. And perhaps this is the secret to his power as a healer and even a priest of sorts. You heal people by listening to their stories, which is what psychoanalysis is about, more or less. But his basic argument is that by strengthening the individual, you strengthen the community, which strengthens the world. You clean your room. Zizek made the point, however, that you know you could also tell a North Korean to, to clean his room and be very orderly and treat his family well and be a nice kind of docile system. But there's obviously something more to the human spirit than that. But Peterson is quite right to say that in order to really help the world, we have to deal with what's intimate, what's near. The too much social justice activity, all this social justice stuff is lacking a certain hard-nosed pragmatism and intelligence and wisdom and depth. And that it's very important to develop our character and all that. So what I'm going to argue here, however, is that this is limited that the individualistic philosophy is a lonely uh, street and it has its particular limits. And also it's an ideology. So Zizek's position is that everything is an ideology. You know, he gave the example of German toilets. They're an expression of German ideology. And it, this just is to tell us how very deep ideology goes. So perhaps Peterson's anti-ideology is actually the ideology of liberalism and individualism. I think Zizek has a point here. You have to constantly refine and create ideology. And ideology means literally just the science of ideas. So there's ideological possession and maybe there's a conscious way of creating ideology. But it's turned out that ideology is usually used in a very negative sense. So in my first piece, I was a bit unfair towards Zizek. Um, I called him a postmodernist. But he's also very critical of this lack of a grand narrative in postmodernism, the sort of idealization of the marginal person and all that. And... Some people have been calling Zizek, just like they called Peterson, Eurocentric. Zizek is very much into theory, you could say. He thinks theory is very important. Peterson is very into pragmatism. So you could say that Zizek is more, let's say, a philosopher, a pure philosopher, and, and Peterson is more like a hands-on psychologist, you know, in the school of Jung and Freud and, and all that. He's, his concern is changing people directly uh, in a very direct way. So, so in a way, that this is one of the reasons that Peterson makes people so upset is that, like, like Jung made people very upset, is that he's so pragmatic and, and so straightforward that the, it drives the academics crazy because they're academics, right? So on one hand, we have Peterson emphasizing the individual, and on the other hand, we have Zizek emphasizing you know, social bureaucracy and collectivism. 
So this brings me to my friend and co-conspirator, Alexander Barg, who has clearly articulated this, and he's helping me um, make a somewhat of a, a friendly critique of both men. Um, in Bard's book, The Netocrats, which is a great book, by the way, he speaks of trends and counter trends. So counter trends are sort of what a, the fallback position when you don't have a, a vision to the future. The counter trend here might be nationalism or traditionalism, you know, in the face of the trend of globalism. So the world's becoming more and more global. So people become more and more reactionary. So this is perhaps why Peterson is, is so conservative. He's falling back into, let's say, Western individualism and maybe a, a Cold War sort of red scare rhetoric, which doesn't mean that he hasn't beautifully and, and correctly uh, described the dynamics of totalitarianism. Only his remedy might be not complete. So collectivist and individualist pathologies will certainly arise in the future, but they won't be the same in the internet uh, age. We need some other kind of diagnosis. So interestingly, uh, Bard considers himself not a socialist or a liberal, not a collectivist or an individualist, but rather a communist, <laughs> which is this heretical word, especially to Peterson and his gang. And I'd rather say communalist. But for him, it's all about reintegrating um, the tribal, communal life. And the fact that tribalism is so deep inside of us, you know, and we need a healthy version of the tribe, of the commune. So perhaps the question of happiness um, or rather deep meaning and fulfillment is not about the individual. It's about finding one's place of maximum meaning uh, in a community. And Bard makes the point, and this is somewhat of a Buddhist point as well, that there is no such thing as an isolated atomic individual per se. Uh, most of the deeper spiritual traditions arrive at this point as well. We're social beings, we have communal needs, and we don't exist apart from that. So again, it's not that Peterson would deny this, only it's not emphasized in his thought. Also, in relation to capitalism, Eric Frum, who was one of the Frankfurt School people, he wrote a book called To Have or To Be. So in the capitalist society, it's all about having, whereas the meaningful existence we, we, we search for, we look for, resides in being. So yes, it's important to develop the individual, but it's being in the team that, that we, we, we thrive. So you could only be happy. And even if this is a rather lame idea, just you know, the purpose of life to be happy, as all the existentialists point out. It's not a goal in itself, but well-being, etc., cetera, is, is, is maybe only possible in the larger family, the larger tribe. And this is the critique of this individualism we're making here. So Nietzsche might be the, the champion of 19th century individualism, just as Marx was the champion of 19th century collectivism. But Nietzsche ended up alone. And we all know where, what happens when society becomes too collectivist. Peterson has spoken about that in length. But the problem is, according to Bard, that neither of these two people have a vision of the future or a revolutionary theory. That's why they both tend towards conservatism. Zizek's defense of social democracy and a controlled free market mechanism, it's not revolutionary. And Peterson's conservatism isn't that radical form of conservatism. So Peterson is a moderate conservative and Zizek is a moderate leftist. Politics are the least interesting part of these two men's thinking, as I've already said. So if you want to really get behind 
you know, Peterson and Zizek, you need to know where they come from, who their masters were, who they study. So with Zizek, it's Hegel and Lacan. Yeah, both very interesting characters. And for Peterson, it's Nietzsche and Jung. So if you want to know about their worldviews, you know, read Hegel and Lacan and Nietzsche and Jung. So why are these men uh, important, despite the critiques we might have? They are the people's philosophers. The people have elected them, so to speak. They're popular not through votes or book marketing or any of that. It's all, you know, their massive popularity is all word of mouth, which means that they're responding to something that's actually happening. And we need more of these popular philosophers. Popular philosophers with integrity rather than pop philosophers. So both men have proved that there is a mass interest in, in, in thinking, right? That we are thinking creatures. We, we need to think our way through these things. And we don't just want ideological cliches or television sound bites. There's a hunger for thought. And both men show that the, the, the subculture has is, is become bigger than the dominant culture, in, in a sense. YouTube has become bigger than TV. Digital has become bigger than broadcast. And digital is a two-way conversation. Right? Broadcast is just a one-way conversation. So this is interesting, creative, chaotic times. And as Zizek, the atheist, puts it, the Holy Spirit is arising. So without being too religious, let's just say that the Holy Spirit is generative intelligence. It's intelligence. It's bright intelligence, which is transforming of people. It's beyond Instagram. It's beyond marketing. It's beyond effects. It's beyond, um, well, there's this philosopher called Harry Frankfurt, and he calls it bullshit. It's beyond bullshit. So Zizek and Peterson are very great anti-bullshit personalities, I think. And even if they differ in their analysis of what the bullshit is, they've brought a new authenticity to the conversation. So contrary to what Peterson, people often say about Peterson, he's a, he's a self-help guru and all that. I would say that I, I would say that he's he's tapping into something much deeper. I'd say he's more of a priest or a faith healer. <laughs> he's helping thousands of people get their lives together. He's making us he's making young, spoiled millennial punks, you know, want to become adults. He's promoting what Alexander Bard calls, and this is a nice term, adultification. We need to become adults. We need to offer adult remedies to the world rather than just engage in armchair activism and various social justice tantrums. There's just too many babies in the, in the revolutionary movements. They're Im immature. They haven't dealt with their own traumatisms. They may be doing more harm than good. So we need to be, as Peterson and Zizek are, critical of these victimhood cults critical of the alt-right or alt-left hysteria, but sympathetic to real social injustices, obviously. So what about the, their writing? Um, I think Zizek, Zizek, excuse me, I always say Zizek, but it's Zizek. I think Zizek is a better writer. He has more sort of flow and spontaneity in his writing. He writes faster. And that's not to say that Peterson isn't a good writer. He's just very compressed and perfectionistic. So it's, his first book, Massive Meeting, is, is a tough read. He, he writes and rewrites every sentence hundreds of times, which makes it very dense and hard to penetrate. Whereas Zizek is very prolific. And he's, I guess he's more free in his expression. Um, I don't want to critique 12 Rules for Life, but it's, it's a peripheral book. It's not an important book. Whereas 
I think Maps and Meanings is an important book. I think 12 Rules, Rules for Life was perhaps written too hastily for the publisher. Even if it is a great, you know, popular self-help manual, you can get all that from Peterson's lectures and, and everything is in Maps and Meaning. Maps and Meaning is, was written in blood. This is Nietzsche's phrase. So even if it's imperfect, it has, it has the essence of Peterson in it. So it's, I think it's an important book. So hopefully Peterson will write another major book, but I think maybe he put everything in that one book. It's not a criticism. And I think that he's also embodying this Guttenberg revolution that he talks about, where the spoken word matters. So back to the debate. Uh, this debate was never about happiness or liberalism versus Marxism. And I've been thinking that that's because that debate is old, old hat. Classic liberalism and orthodox Marxism are, are not important, except as historical systems. We need new imaginative vocabulary for the social and economic dynamics today. And I'm with my friend Alexander Bard on this, that we have to come up with a new grand narrative. And we can use Marx, we can reinvent him without becoming insane collectivists. And there's a new sort of dynamic and class struggle between what he calls the netocrats and the consumerists, the hidden people behind the internet and the people who just consume. So the, all that's to say that the, the rules of the game had, have shifted. So in the debate, both men agree that liberalism won the war of the 20th century, won that ideological war. But the question then remains is, has the dynamic now shifted? And are we in the age of eminent ecological collapse? Do we have to think of development in a different way? Do we have to rethink communalism or communism? You know, of some sort. And living together in a different way. And in order to be Christian, you're, you're part of a congregation. You're part of a, you go to church. Uh, just like a, a, if you're a Buddhist, you're, you're part of the Buddhist Sangha. You know, you go and gather together. It's not a lonely individualist enterprise. So if you were talking about Buddhist lingo, which I'm particularly familiar with, you could say Peterson gets the idea of Buddha and Dharma, but not the idea of Sangha. And the nuclear family is not, is not the human unit. It's a very new organizational mode and it has its faults, pathologies. And I think today we're searching for a different ways of being together. And we need a congregation, we need a sangha if we're gonna talk about religion. You, you can't talk about religion without talking about communal life. So eight billion sovereign individuals is a pretty lost world. So anyway, what I'm arguing here is that a Peterson perhaps is too much of an apologist for individualism and Zizek perhaps is too much of an apologist for collectivism. The point is, both men don't have a, a grand narrative. And what is the grand narrative? And what should the grand narrative be? Um, we are creating narratives. We are creating grand narratives all the time. And, and one of the grand narratives we're creating is a sort of doomsday fatalism uh, related to ecology and the kind of zombie consumerist nihilism and you know there's all kinds of narratives social you know collective narratives being created and perhaps we need something higher to aim at in the 21st century which is very different than the 20th century and we can't use 19th century modes and expect them to work in the in the 21st century you know whether it's classical market marxism or free market liberalism there's no invisible hand. There's no perfect communist state. 
but we do perhaps need a need a utopian vision of a better world you know a promised land um bard thinks this should be called the ecotopia but who knows what we will call it karl marx was badly treated by peterson he didn't he didn't show a great knowledge of marx and if you're arguing against marx perhaps you, you need to you need to study him a bit more deeply and not just the people who hate him and we could also say that is is marx and you know peterson adores nietzsche um, and nietzsche inspired hitler to a great degree does that mean that nietzsche is uh the devil so if marx inspired stalinism does that mean Marx is the devil? I don't know. Maybe Hitler misread Nietzsche and maybe Mao and Stalin misread Marx. So with Marx, maybe we have to separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, to use Peterson's favorite expression. Maybe we have to read these thinkers properly rather than just straw manning them in a polemical way. So Peterson is masterful at showing the pathological elements of postmodernism and the worst parts of, of Marxism. But he's Manichaean right here. He won't grant much truth value. He says he'll give the devil his due, but he's still saying the devil. He's still saying it's the devil, right? So it seems to be a very uh, Manichaean argument of absolute good versus absolute evil, rather than a view beyond good and evil, right? which is based more on, on pragmatism, which is based on ethics. Maybe Marx also saw a few things, like he actually saw communal societies developing in England and Germany. He definitely didn't promote revolution in, in, in feudal states like China and Russia in the 19th century. So then the question, so the question becomes, you know, also, well, you know, what about the negative aspects of capitalism, like mass alienation and depression and all these different psychoses that the, 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 you know, the system of late capitalism engenders. So Peterson doesn't have this critique of late capitalism and its predatory kind of economics and all the environmental rapaciousness. You know, he hasn't been able to show that this risk economy uh, this may be running out of steam. So what kind of system do we need? Well, non-zero sum game, non-rival cooperative economics, you know, animated by a grand narrative. One thing is for sure, we don't need bloody revolution. And we don't need postmodernism, postmodern relativism. And yes, we need values, hierarchies of values. And yes, there's something above and below us, unlike what John Lennon said. So we need to look up to somebody and something, and we need to understand that we're part of, you know, a larger story. So I'm with Peterson on that. Peterson also admits that there are unjust hierarchies. So. We could say that maybe the movement in history towards egalitarianism and is a good thing. And Peterson doesn't have this particular egalitarian vis vision, even if he's totally correct to say that equality of opportunity is what we should be aiming at and not equality of outcome. So I had another thought, which is provocative. And my thought is, who's the revolutionary here? Who's the hot-headed revolutionary? Is it Zizek or Peterson? And again, perhaps Peterson's hatred of Marx indicate, indicates this sort of intimacy with Marx's ideas. Perhaps he comes from the, the left and he's reacting against Marx, but he's got some leftist you know, qualities in him. So he's the he's the leader of the revolutionary of the proletariat so to speak lifting up working class men everywhere 
And Zizek, on the other hand, is, a, is an elitist, you know, he's a bourgeois elitist. And he's a bit of a conservative. He's critical of progressive movements, even while he supports them. And he's an apologist for Christianity, which he views as the greatest moral system of all time, which is not exactly what you would think your average Marxist revolutionary who thinks that religion is the opiate of, pe of the people would, would think. Peterson wants to change the world. He's out to change the world, one person at a time. I don't know if I could make a sustained argument that Peterson is a Marxist and Zizek is a conservative, but as a thought experiment and provocation, maybe it works a little bit. The point is there's this shadowy negation of each affirmation of a belief. This is, maybe this is what Lacan is about. I'm not sure. I don't know Lacan well enough. Um, certainly it's what Carl Jung in the shadow is about. So the idea is that the part of yourself that you've rejected, that you despise, that you hate, may be animating you to a certain extent. And so then maybe Zizek is a closet conservative and Peterson is a closet Marxist. In any case, I love both these men. I think they embody the spirit of the time. I think they're very honest. And they're not beholden to media companies, which is so refreshing. And Peterson is honest enough to talk about virtue and character and all these old-fashioned values. And Zizek is honest enough to confess his perversions and be unpolitically correct. And both are attacking this shallow moralizing, which is great. So a good thinker has to be offensive to dogma and ruffle feathers. You know, Zizek ruffles Noam Chomsky's feathers, which makes me think Noam Chomsky is a bit of a Puritan. And Peterson is, you know, offensive to a lot of people on the left and the right. You know, the church people love him and hate him. The social justice warriors, to him, he's some sort of, you know, bad daddy. I think they have daddy issues. Uh, but there's people on the left who are probably closet um, Petersonians, like me, but I, I haven't been in the closet I've just been saying it <laughs> so again hallelujah these men are out there we need these fights and wars of intellect not of actual wars and the more the more people talk the more we can create a reasonable society and it's great that these events are big like sporting events you know it's raising the level of the culture and I think both men have this great sense of humor, especially Zizek. And we need to have a sense of humor above all. We need to flirt and joke and, you know, sometimes talk dirty and not fear this intense social castration that is everywhere, you know, these days. We have to be humorous, but deadly humorous and deadly serious at the same time. So, you know, I've critiqued these people, these men, they're both flawed. Peterson, Peterson's individuality is a flawed philosophy. Zizek's collectivism and pessimism is lacking something. And what I think is missing is, is the right idea of community, of the commons, of the Buddha Sangha, of the congregation, small sacred communities, a remedy to too much individualism. And we all know the cost of too much collectivism, which is even worse, because it just destroys everything, right? So I think we need small sanghas to cultivate the Holy Spirit. That's where intelligence blossoms. And that's where even the, the saint, because Peterson's kind of like has a saintly quality, and the pervert, because Zizek has this perverted quality. You know, They're both allowed to be there. Uh, they're both welcome. Hallelujah. And thanks for listening.